If you would like our free newsletters on various religious topics, just send us an email at cdebater at aol.com and free newsletters will be sent to you by mail. Just provide your postal address in your email. The following are samples of some of the newsletters we have available. Does God Believe in Atheists? Part 1 Seventh-day Adventism True or False The Agony of Deceit The Origins of Muhammad's Religion Spiritual Warfare Are Psychic Mediums Communicating with Ghosts or Demonic Spirits? Testimony to the Eternal Godhead, the Trinity. From Tradition to Truth, a Priest's Story. An Evaluation of the Oneness Pentecostal Movement. Mormonism, Counterfeit Christianity. Turn or Burn. Jehovah's Witnesses, Deceived Deceivers. Links to these newsletters can also be found at our website www.biblequery.org Once on the home page, simply click on the menu icon at the upper left hand corner. Then click on the newsletters button. Feel free to print them out. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers, and I want to thank you for being here for Christian Answers Presents. And with me is one of my very special friends and guests here, a uh, close brother in the Lord, uh, my partner in mm -hmm. this ministry, Steve Morrison of, the, uh, of Christian Answers, the Director of Research for Christian Answers. So if I ever want extensive research, on any type of subject, I just tell Steve, and the next thing you know, he gives me way more research than I ever could have imagined. So it's kind of cool, you know. In fact, some of your websites, I think, were created just mm -hmm. because I said, hey, we need to put some stuff some out pages, on Islam, yeah. or we need some stuff on church history. And next thing I know, he creates whole websites. In fact, speaking of that, Steve, go ahead and tell our viewers your websites. All right, well, we have a few websites. Uh, www.biblequery.org, uh, among other things, it answers over 9,100 um, questions on the Bible. It also has a lot, like Larry was saying, on church history, including grids of uh, kind of like engineer meets theologian, I guess, <laughs> of, of what early Christians believed and uh, uh, other beliefs and different topics. We have a second website, uh, www.muslimhope.com, where I put in all the things that, that uh, I've read, all of the Muslim hadiths, uh, the Quran, cover to cover, you know, uh, multiple times, and all, these, and all these things there. And it's about the great hope Muslims have when they leave Islam and find the real Jesus. And it's not as much uh, to saying, oh, Islam is bad or ugly or, or whatever. It's for people to, like, read what early Muslims and Muhammad uh, and, and the um, early writers uh, who are Muslim themselves said about it. So you can kind of judge for yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then a uh, third site kind of uh, gleams the historical parts of both the first two sites. It's called www.historycarts.com, and it has a bunch about what happened in history in different parts of the world at different times and a lot of the, the early writings. And uh, you have an email address that people can write to if they have Bible questions or uh, yes, it, 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 uh, it's on the website, but if you want to have it directly, it's a cdebater at aol.com. 
And, um, you know, and sometimes there's a delay because I do get lots of questions and, and doing research, but, you know, I, I'll, I try to get back to people with questions. Right, right. you got to give us some time there. We also get a lot of requests for, uh, old, you know, newsletters we've produced in the past. They want, people want to mail or email or things like this, and sometimes we get overwhelmed with so many requests. We can't keep up mm-hmm. immediately, So, but sooner or later... We'll, we'll get it to you, you know, better late than never. Yeah. Uh, but we, we're, we're trying to do with what we have. And uh, if you do send us uh, an email or a request for literature, free literature to be sent to you or newsletters, something like that, mm. uh, sooner or later you're going to get it. It just may not be right away because, you know, we don't, we don't ask for money here. We don't have a paid staff. We just do what we can for the Lord with what the Lord's given us and the outreach uh, that we have and so we just do what we can well with that uh we want to get into a subject today that's rather fascinating uh as usual i asked steve to do some research and the next thing you know he's about to present all this stuff off just one of my little requests i was uh hearing some things and dealing with some uh, roman catholic apologists who were big carl keating fans mm-hmm. And uh, Steve, since you've done all this research along the lines of what I asked you to do, could you just briefly, and I think you've got a stack of books here on the table uh, about this man named Carl Keating. Can you tell our all viewers right. about him? Uh, uh, Carl Keating, is, we are Christian apologists. We are Protestants. Um, Carl Keating is a Roman Catholic apologist who defends um, Catholicism, and we'll get a little more into him later. Um, So anyway, I ordered and read all of um, five books by him, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, um, The Francis Feud, which to me, not knowing as much about Pope Francis, I found this particularly fascinating, Um, The Usual Suspects, um, What Catholics Really Believe, maybe a little bit more basic and stuff, Uh, Debating Catholics, which is some debate uh, transcripts between Carl Keating and uh, some rather interesting people, uh, uh, Ruckman, uh, 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 Iglesia ne Cristo, which no. they deny the divinity of Christ. That's a cult. So, 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 so it's like you're not really sure who to you know root for here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, right. so, 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 uh, but but one thing that we wanted to do in this video before we got um, uh, too far along, it it is is mention something about the the bad popes. And uh, some Catholics, you know, deny that any popes were bad. Uh, maybe they don't know anything about history, um, or, the, or they, um, you know, just don't want to admit it or whatever. Um, Carl Keating, it, it is not that way though. Uh, he freely admits that there were bad popes and they did bad things, and he does not defend their bad things. However, there's one thing I strongly take issue with him on, though. He said that the, uh, he says there are about 265 popes, and of those, only about six or seven were bad. Um, he says this, for example, in um, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, uh, page 316, uh, where, where he basically says, um, uh, Yes, there have been some bad popes, perhaps six or seven being truly unworthy of the office. Given the large number of popes, that's a proportion of about one in 40. Okay. And then he says, but uh, one of the 12 men in Christ turned out to be bad. So, you know, and, and, and he said, well, that's not convincing of itself. But what I take issue with is him saying that there were six or seven bad popes. Okay. I don't know for sure how many bad popes there were. But from my count is at least 46, not six or seven. Uh, he also says similar in the Francis Feud, page one, uh, 111 and also 137. So what I'd like to do is go through and just list the bad popes. Now, uh, our the purpose in this is to just, uh, this will be used as part of uh, reference in other videos later, but just to show the kinds of people that when you talk about papal succession, here's where they came from. We're not going to show uh, extensive life histories of any popes. Uh, we're not going to, uh, to, it's more of a breadth thing to where we just want to list them and some of these names you can look up yourselves on Google or, or on Wikipedia or in uh, uh, other books, either by non-Catholics or even by, um, you, you know, knowledgeable um, uh, Catholics. You know, uh, um, Gary Wells is someone else I was reading to get like a different perspective. Don't you have a book? Don't you? Yeah, uh, he, uh, Gary Wells, um, he has a little... Um, uh, Different perspective than Carl Keating. He's also a Catholic. His book is called Why I Am a Catholic. 
Right, and 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 um, we'll talk a little bit more about him later. The, though I've researched more with Carl Keating, so 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 with that, we we just want to get in to give you a kind of a little um, surface level thing about who these popes were that were the bad popes. Uh, before I do that, though, I'd like to read a scripture to you, Second uh, Timothy chapter four, and it is a prophecy by Paul. And it says, A time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, meaning Timothy, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Okay, so we just want to see some of the people uh, and kind of what they have done. Uh, we're not going to talk about what does papal succession mean or uh, what about papal succession really at all in this video. We're saving that for uh, a, a video coming up on um, uh, why Catholics don't need a pope. But for now, we're just going to give a listing of who, uh, at least in my opinion, the bad popes were and the reasons, and you can kind of judge for yourself. Okay, so with that, um, I guess I'd like to, uh, uh, to read uh, just a quote of some of the really bad ones in Austin's Topical History of Christianity, page 148. He says, Then, and the context is after 904 AD, began the so-called pornocracy, during which Theodora and her two daughters, Theodora the Younger and Morosia, virtually controlled Rome and the church itself. Enticing harlots, these women have sold their bodies for positions, titles, and land, giving them widespread power. Morosia had an illicit affair with Pope Sergius III, from which was born a son who later became Pope John XI. When Morosia sought to have herself crowned empress, her younger son Alberic kidnapped and imprisoned his mother, incarcerated his half-brother, the Pope, and became emperor himself. He reigned from 932 to 954, exercising absolute control over the papacy. So he was not the Pope, but he exercised control over the Pope. After Albert's death, his son Octavian was elected as Pope John XII and proved to be the most odious member of this depraved family. Okay, this is a pretty sad situation here that happened. Um, there was a um, false rumor that occurred centuries later where people said there was a female pope, and it may have come from this, but the truth of the matter is, you know, historically speaking, there never was a female pope. Um, but see, these women sure control the men who, 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 who held the, the Harleys. So anyway, so let's just go historically and just see uh, some of these bad posts. Most of these bad posts weren't as bad as this, but they were still kind of bad. Oh, well, by the way, for our viewers, we have another video by a former Roman Catholic priest, Richard Bennett. He was a Roman Catholic priest for 22 years before he actually got born again and saved by God. But we have a video by him on all the murdered popes. <laughs> and all the chicanery, uh, it's not going to be as big a detail as what we're getting ready to see from Steve here. But anyway, I just want to give a reference to, to that particular video also. Yeah, those who are watching this video right now ought to really consider checking out another video we have on our YouTube channel called Vatican System, List of Murdered Popes, 75 Popes Approved Torture, Murder, Burning at the Stake. It'll be a good historical review and quite fascinating, too, to watch and learn about all these facts that are conveniently ignored by the Roman Catholic Church and their apologists. All right, well, that, that, that might have more depth, but this will have more breadth. All right, so, <laughs> so, so, so uh, the, the first thing is that uh, when was there a pope in Rome? Well, actually, the term pope referring to the bishop in Rome that was unknown to early Christians until the Council of Arles in uh, 314 AD. And it was just kind of mentioned in, in passing. So before then, you won't really talk about popes in Rome. It was the bishops in Rome. And of course, there are bishops in many major cities. Mm -hmm. uh, but the first two popes um, were, uh, that were bad were uh, Zephyrinus, who supported Sabellianism, and uh, this is according to Hippolytus, and uh, his successor, kind of chosen by him, Callistus uh, I, he was a Sabellian, and, and, and he also falsified the truth. This is according to both uh, the church writer Caius and Hippolytus. Now, you'll have to say something here, because you can't assume the audience knows what a Sabellian is. 
Okay. A uh, Sabalian basically denies the Trinity, and they say that the 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 uh, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all the same. Uh, they were sometimes called Patripassians, meaning that the that you could say that the Father died on the cross. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because they just say Jesus is the Father, Jesus is right. the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and there are people who have some similarities to him today, as well as some differences, uh, called a oneness. Uh, oneness uh, Pentecostals. Uh, yeah, 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 so anyway, a oneness Pentecostals kind of point to these guys, and unfortunately there is something to it. Um, they, um, you know, the, these guys did that. So, so <laughs> here's what Caius wrote about it. And this is from Eusebius's Ecclesiastical History, Book 5, Chapter 28. And so Eusebius is recording this. For they say that all those of the first age and the apostles themselves both received and taught those things which these men now maintain, and that the truth of the gospel preaching was preserved until the times of Victor, he was the Roman bishop uh, before this, who was the 13th bishop of Rome from Peter, and that from his successor, Zephyr, the truth was falsified. All right, so this is charging the Pope with falsifying the truth. Okay, and this is, and perhaps what they alleged might be credible did not the Holy Scriptures that first contradict them. And then beside, there were writings of certain brethren older than the times of Victor. And I'll just skip over because uh, um, Caius references all of these early church writers that taught the truth up through Victor. Skipping ahead in Eusebius, he talks more about what Victor did. He talked about a Theodotus who was a banker who taught heresy about it and how he went before Zephyrinus, you know, said he repented of that. All right, Steve, uh, once again, you're reading all this. Uh, remind the viewers at home, uh, again, what the name of this book is you're reading from. All right, uh, this is a 10-volume series called The Anti, meaning before, Nicene Fathers. Okay. And it has a... Um, what volume is that? Uh, this is volume five. It's a ten volume series. Um, it has most, though not all, of the uh, of the Christian writings prior to the Council of Nicaea. There are a few books that have a, a few more, um, and so and they're like around four. 200 pages or so total written then. So we have a pretty good idea of what the church was like then. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, we can go into a lot of church history in that, but just want, want to say that, that even back then, and Hippolytus goes in more detail as to how they support, uh, first su supported Sibelius, and then kind of Sibelianism, and then there's a falling out, and then things kind of went back to uh, how, they, how they should have been with, with Rome. But there are some issue, real issues in Rome. Now, what's interesting to me is you have read all the anti-Nicene Fathers, mm -hmm. all these books, all the volumes. Well, and three or four more too, yeah. Yeah, see, so I just it. wanted to point that out to our audience. How many of you out there would actually read all these volumes of early church history? Hmm. <laughs> this guy right here did it. And he's got a website to prove it. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. All right. So, so uh, another, beside these two popes, we're just kind of moving on to get more breath here. Another was uh, Zosimus. At this time, uh, popes in Rome, they weren't, they were called bishops more than popes, but the per, or pope had been used, so you can call him bishop or whatever. And he opposed uh, Augustine for supporting Pelagius. Uh, later on, though, and Augustine wrote a lot against Pelagius, later on, though, uh, Zosimus backtracked and said that, well, he hadn't supported anything definitely. So Zosimus kind of admittedly taught uh, wrong doctrine, but he kind of said, well, this wasn't official and it wasn't really settled yet, and they were discussing it, and the lady went to his side. Okay, well, now, once again, as you bring up Pelagius, mm -hmm. you need to tell the viewers at home, what was so bad about Pelagius? All right, so, 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 so Pelagius uh, did not believe that, that, that people ha, ha, uh, have a sin nature. He believed that people were born uh, morally neutral, and the only thing that Adam and Eve did was set a bad example. Okay, All so, right, so, so he's, almost, he's just almost denying that you have any kind of uh, inclination towards sin. Right. That you're like born in sin, and it's part of your nature right. to actually like it's, sin it, and do sin. Yes, it, so, so the Catholic Church, as well as Eastern Orthodox, as well as Protestant denominations, they, um, they, they all say Pelagius is wrong, but Zosimus initially uh, what, uh, uh, supported Pelagius' teaching, though, uh, though Augustine later set him straight. All right, so, so that was bad. Maybe not as bad as what we read at the beginning, but uh, that was bad. Uh, all right, so Stephen the sixth in 896, 897 A.D., 
he had something kind of morbid. It's been called the Cadaver Synod because uh, the previous pope, Pope Formosus, who had died, when Stephen became pope, um, he uh, brought up, he had them dig up Formosus' body out of the grave and sat in a chair, and he tried this corpse uh, for heresy. All right. Now, um, and, and, and the punishment was that. Uh, yeah, what, what, uh, what, what, well, he didn't. There was no punishment for doing that. Later on, though, Stephen the Sixth was one of the popes who was murdered, so that someone else could be pope after him. Yeah, but you said right here the punishment to me, I thought was defingered. Yes, he cut his fingers off. Is that his punishment? He cut the fingers off of the corpse. <laughs> Which doesn't seem very honoring of the office now, of Pope. Now we're in the, uh, the I've got it on the table here, the Roman Catholic, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Catechism. Mm -hmm. Where does it say to definger a corpse for uh, supposed sins and errors? Uh, nowhere. Uh, see, see, so, so they did a lot of things that aren't in the in, in Vatican II, much less later catechism. So uh, now, now, as as far as how heretical Formosus was, um, the the this was probably trumped up by, by, by Stephen VI. What had happened was that Formosus had been bishop of more than one place, which was greatly looked down upon at the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so Stephen had his own agenda for doing that. So actually, I didn't list Formosus as one of the bad popes here because we don't have evidence of that. But I think it's justifiable to list Stephen the Sixth as one of the bad popes, yes. you know, uh, not to point fingers. And that might uh, have been one reason he was later murdered. Somebody uh, might have thought he was a bad pope. And I don't think needed to be gotten rid of. Right, and, and we're not sure he murdered just because of the guy ever synod, but uh, politically they want to get rid of him. Okay, another bad pope was a uh, Pope Innocent the Third, and he made possible the papal states. Now, most people haven't heard of those today, probably. The Papal States were kingdoms uh, in Italy that their king essentially was the pope. And they were needed by the Pope um, to, uh, for tribute, for money for the Vatican. Um, they raised armies so that they could fight their battles against the other cities. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how does someone who's supposed to be leading the church in Rome, or at least they would claim all the church, how does he need his own army to fight other cities in Italy? Mm -hmm. And he often opposed the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor, which was typically based out of Germany, future popes did, because it would cut into their power uh, trying to take control of Italy uh, for the Papal States. And so they kept trying to expand that. And then finally, in the, you, know, um, you, know, you hear of Garibaldi in like the, the 19th century who unified Italy, and he was a great patriot and everything. And you know, Italians know about him, but, but who is he unifying Italy from? He was basically um, conquering the Papal States, taking them away from, po from the Pope and adding them to Italy. Now, didn't there a Bible verse that says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal? Right. <laughs> yeah, see, 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 so you don't spread the gospel by the sword. One, it doesn't work uh, to truly bring people to Christ. I mean, it can work to give you wealth and empire and power and stuff like that, but that's that's a fraud. That that's not what what Jesus wants us to do. Well, that would make him a bad pope if he's doing something that's against what the Bible says. Well, it's not only him. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we're we're going to see some others too. Another one who we read about. The well, beginning. you did say here in the paperwork. He, uh, he condemned the English Magna Carta. Right. So the English Magna Carta what, what it was a famous document in England that limited the power of the king. So it was kind of like it was a start of like maybe checks and balances, you know, mm -hmm. with the nobles and the king. You know, there wasn't any parliament at that time, but yeah. it was kind of like a predecessor to that. Yeah. And he thought he condemned that way off in England because that would, you know, reduce the power of the top sovereign and he didn't want yeah, that like, Yeah, because he's trying to get all this power and, and right. And money and everything, so, so, so. and that Magna Carta is interfering with what he's got planned. Right, and so does the Pope really need to be involved with politics? Does he need to have his own army? Does he need to um, fight people? Well, Pope Innocent the Three would say yes. All right, uh, Pope Sergius the, the Third from 904 to 911 A.D. We'd read about him at the beginning. Uh, Morosia uh, was his mistress as Pope. And uh, he fathered Pope John the Eleventh. Now we know for sure that John the Eleventh was a son of Morosia. 
we are pretty sure that Sergius III was the father, though we're not totally sure about Morosia. It could have been somebody else, but if... Well, you mentioned earlier at the, the, in this video that she's sort of like a harlot or something. Yeah, so Sergius, you know, he probably is the father of John XI. We're not totally sure, but regardless, Morosia was his mistress as Pope. So, you know, being a pope or a cardinal, you don't have to, of course, have a job, you know, a, a, a secular job, but you don't have to have a wife either. You just can have mistresses. But wouldn't that tie into the idea of papal succession in this fact that, well, if I'm going to be pope and I, I have sex with this woman and she gives me a child, well, that's mm. even a closer bond to having succession. You know, yeah, this next it, pope it, it, is going to be the pope because I fathered him in a sexual act. Right, and he wasn't pope immediately after him, but but uh, basically many popes uh, practiced nepotism, which we're gonna get into in a little bit, uh, where they would have relatives that would get it, uh, become cardinals, and they would kind of groom them, though they couldn't guarantee that they could be a future pope after him. So, in the Bible, does it say that for papal succession, you should have sex with a woman so you can have a, an offspring that'll become the pope? Is there any Bible? Uh, no, no, <laughs> no for that, no for papal succession. Uh, so, so the it, Bible has nothing to do with this kind of activity, right? This is, uh, I guess, extra biblical activity. Uh, anyway, so of course, John the Eleventh, who became Pope, with that, um, and she was overthrown in in 932, is kind of like the uh, Empress or person of power. Uh, John the Twelfth. Uh, his mother was Theodora, Morosia's sister. So you see how the papacy at this time is all just a family kind of thing. You didn't say this other part here on the paperwork mm -hmm. about uh, John the Twelve. It says mother was the prostitute Theodora, the sister. Right, of uh, Morosia. Prostitute is a uh, a word that really conveys an idea that mm -hmm. goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago. There's a lot of sex going on right here. Right, in the Vatican. Okay. Um, also, uh, Benedict, now he's kind of funny because he he was Pope from t uh, 1032 to 1044, and then he, he would do stuff like he would abdicate being Pope, and he would sell uh, the office of Pope to somebody for money, and then he might become considered Pope again, and so he was involved in sexual immorality, which was, uh, I mean, you can understand it was kind of common for popes here at the time. And he sold the papacy, and he, eventually he abdicated as pope. You know, he got his money, and, and, he, and he left. All right. Now, that reminds me of Acts chapter 8 with Simon Magus, mm -hmm. who tried to buy the Holy Spirit with money. Right. And do you remember what Peter told him when he may, tried to... May your money perish with you. Yes, yeah, and if yeah, you look yeah. into the Greek, it actually it's like saying, "May you and your money go to hell." Yeah, <laughs> and uh, here we have a pope that's actually committing the same sin. What what what, what reversing? He wasn't trying to buy anything; he was trying to sell. That's what I mean. But Even the worse. idea was he's selling some kind of spiritual nature position in a church, right? Uh, and so, to me, it's almost like. But I agree with you, but it's at the same time, he's selling, like, the office of God mm. <laughs> for yeah. money. Right. And, uh, and, and, and so some, when someone says they believe in papal succession, they are basically saying that future popes uh, succeeded from these guys. That's right. uh, I'm not sure. That would be kind of an insult, I think, to now, future popes. Now, if you go to a, a local church, mm -hmm. don't you think the best way to select a pastor of your local church is to make sure that, you know, he's the offspring of a prostitute that, uh, you know, thinks that... And the previous pastor. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, if we follow this pattern... Right. For just coming up with a good pastor of well, a church. Well, th thank goodness we don't follow that pattern. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Gregory the, the Seventh, he was different. Uh, we don't know of any particular sexual scandals with him. Uh, he was from 1073 to 1085. He tried to start a crusade. And, of course, everyone thinks of the crusades. They think of the armies going to the Middle East and everything else. Uh, no, this was different. This way, he tried to start a crusade in the um, northeastern part of Europe, uh, modern day uh, like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, yeah. uh, kind of eastern Poland. Because uh, the people there, many of which were called Wends, uh, they were not Christian, and by golly, they were going to get their goods taken away from them and killed unless until they became Christian. Uh, he failed to start it, though, but he tried. Uh, later on, we'll see popes after him did start it. Okay, now, um, Adrian IV, he didn't do a whole lot. He was pope for five years, 1154 to 1159. The English king asked him for permission to invade Ireland. 
Okay. Okay. Military action. Yeah. Now, I don't know if this is relevant or not, but Adrian IV was uh, English. Uh, mm. And mm. anyway, uh, what, uh, what he did is, is he gave permission. It, 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 well, he gave permission, but he kind of said, you know, for, 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 for that dreary, you know, cold country, I don't know why anybody would want to invade it, but sure. Uh, now, you think about invading them to Christianize and subdue these wild pagan Irish. Actually, that's totally false. The, 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 the Irish were Christians ever since the time of St. Patrick, about you know, 440 or so AD. Uh, they actually founded many monasteries in continental Europe. So they were actually a sending center for Christian missionaries. And they had um, Christian tradition going almost a, a, as far back a, as, as England. And yet the English king is going to invade them. But he asked the Pope, and the Pope says, sure, go ahead and take them over. Okay, why did he need to do this? Why couldn't he just say, just be happy with your own country? Well, you know, the problem is always the same with Roman Catholicism in that they don't seem to care what the Scripture says, what the Bible Scriptures says. Scriptures are kind of ir ir irrelevant here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and ever since then, you know, I mean, throughout the centuries, the English have been felt like, you know, Ireland was their right. Mm -hmm. And, of course, yeah, I guess so. The Pope said so. Mm -hmm. Of course, Scripture never says so. Well, see, that's the whole reason that Roman Catholicism doesn't accept sola scriptura, the Bible alone, Scripture mm -hmm. alone. They don't because they're doing so many things that are against what the Scripture teaches. Right. They have to discard it so they can do yeah all these these worldly things. Yeah. So which Scripture says to invade a, an, another nation or invade a Christian nation? Uh, none whatsoever. So Gregory the Ninth, he had a, uh, in 1227 to 1241, he had a crusade against the Holy Roman Empire. And someone once said about the Holy Roman Empire, well, it wasn't actually holy, it wasn't actually Roman, and it wasn't actually an empire, but other than that, it's a good name. <laughs> uh, so, so with all the shenanigans going on with the Holy Roman Empire emperors, it was pretty evil. It was kind of, it was most of Central Europe, uh, from Germany through Italy, uh, excluding France. Um, and, um, it, and, and, and it was really kind of a... Um, People who had a nominal uh, loyalty, I guess, to the emperor. So the emperor was always struggling to, to maintain stuff. It wasn't very cohesive. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Gregory the Ninth started a crusade against these people. Uh, Gregory the Ninth, he also started the, the Inquisition in Languedoc, France, in the southern part of France. He endorsed the Crusades in northeastern Europe. So the Crusades here which did start going in the Baltic regions. It's called the Baltic Crusade. Uh, so he endorsed that. Oh, by the way, I just want to mention to our viewers that we have a video again by Richard Bennett, the former Roman Catholic priest for 22 years, on the Inquisition, which is very fascinating to see what kind of evil things they did to people just because of that Inquisition. In okay. case you didn't know whether, in fact, uh, we ought to just, for a, for a moment, Describe what the Inquisition is for those people watching right now that have no clue what you're talking about when you say that. So the, the Inquisition actually is not one thing. It's actually like five or six Inquisitions. There were separate Inquisitions in Spain, which was spread to, to Portugal. There are Inquisitions in France. There's Inquisitions in Italy. There was a separate Inquisition in just Rome. Uh, there were there were in inquisitions in most of the country, and it turns out there are inquisitions in the New World, in all of the lands that Spain and Portugal had. So what the inquisition was was where you would have people who would look for heresy, and they would be people who might be. Um, uh, Jewish people, the, the Jews, well, if they had to be ex expelled or forcibly converted, they were still secretly practicing Judaism. So find them and root them out and take their goods and torture them or kill them. Uh, and, and then if they converted to Christianity under torture, um, then maybe let them off or maybe not. Uh, it, it, uh, ditto for Muslims. Uh, ditto for heretics, uh, such as uh, Protestants. Uh, later on, uh, and many Catholics were actually caught up in the, disp in, in the Inquisition. There was a, one Catholic lady, when she was caught by the Inquisition, she was so scared, she said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm guilty. Uh, what did I do? <laughs> uh, and, and, and so if you don't like somebody, you could even, you know, have oh, yeah, you know, just a false Trump accusation Trump to get somebody killed. Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 it, and now at this time, the Inquisition wasn't supposed to kill people. And later on, though, uh, when uh, people who were under, shall we call it questioning, 
uh, expired was their term yes. uh, for, for died. The inquisitors weren't supposed to have killed them. So what they could do, they could give themselves absolution and then it would be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but at this time is kind of when it started. Uh, next Pope, Innocent IV, who was 1243 to 1254, he gave a very ugly official Catholic teaching called Papal Bulls, our official Catholic teaching, though some of them have been rescinded. He gave one is called Super Exter Patium, also one called Ad Exper Panda, and an authorized torture for the Inquisition. All right, he also tried to have the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II uh, murdered or assassinated. And, of course, he used inquisitors to get rid of his enemies, and he also raised money by selling indulgences. So, well, go, What's an indulgence for the viewers? Well, if you read your Bible, you will have no clue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but an indulgence was, it, it says that, that when a, a Catholic commits a, uh, a venial sin... What's a venial uh, it, it, sin? Which means like it is not as bad as a mortal sin. Uh, What's they, a mortal sin? A mortal, <laughs> a mortal sin, they say, well, you lose your salvation uh, and you would go to hell. A, a venial sin says that you would suffer and, and spend time in purgatory suffering there until uh, things got cleaned up and then you would go to heaven. And indulgences, so what's purgatory? I mean, well, that's another thing. If, if, if you read your scriptures, uh, you will have no clue. <laughs> uh, but, but purgatory is a place in Roman Catholicism, not in Eastern Orthodoxy or, or any other church uh, that they made up, basically, that, that, that says this is the place to where uh, people would go who are going to heaven, but they aren't pure and holy yet. And so they go through this uh, painful, fiery uh, 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 place or at least painful place to to um have their sins purged and then after that they go to heaven but you can get some of those sins dealt with by giving money to the church people now, that's an indulgence yes that's an indulgence uh not only that but other people could give money for you uh, so even after you died, you could do that. Uh, also, uh, for mortal sins, uh, so they would say you lose your salvation, but you could go to a priest and then confess your sins, yes. and then the the, the, the the priest could pronounce your sins forgiven, but to make sure for you, that you were forgiven, you he might have you do something. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes for some sins, it might be to say a Hail Mary a number of times or a certain mm -hmm. number of prayers. Sometimes it would be like give money to the church. Mm -hmm. And then way ahead of this time in Martin Luther's time, uh, they would sell indulgences to where if you knew you were going to sin, you could just prepay, and then the sin would be okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's sad. Indulgence. So you sell indulgences, and they have what they're called um, partial indulgences that would take away some of the time in purgatory, but not all of it. Then they have plenary indulgences that take away all of your time in purgatory for a sin, and, and it would be for the venial sins and for the mortal sins. Uh, and so you get into all of this business of selling money and raising money for the church. And so this Innocent the Four, kind of a funny name there um, for a Pope, Innocent, um, <laughs> he started all this stuff. Okay, uh, John the 21st uh, was involved with nepotism, and nepotism is in two kinds of nepotism. One, getting high church positions for relatives. Mm -hmm. So in many church positions, what would happen is that if, if you were, let's say, a priest, and you, or you want to become a bishop, all right, you would let them know you want to become a bishop, and you would say, I'm willing to pay this much money um, to become a bishop, and some of that money would go to the Pope, some would go to the church or the cardinals and uh, over them, and some would even might go to the local, you know, local kings, mm -hmm. and then if what you want to pay to become a bishop was more than other people want to pay to become a bishop, then you could become a bishop. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't always based on the highest amount of money. There was also family connections. Mm -hmm. And ditto for bishop as for cardinal. In fact, uh, one guy we'll re read about later, um, he made one of his nephews a cardinal who was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, the more cardinals you have, the more people can vote, you know, more voting power for the next popes. And, and, That's right. and so stuff. there's political connections there, yeah, too, yeah, especially yeah. you have family relations. Right. Uh, there's all that intrigue going on with that. Yeah. So that's one kind of nepotism. So there's also a second kind of nepotism. And the second kind is forget about church positions and stuff, but just uh, give money and lands and money from the papal treasury. Uh, you can get one ruler to agree to conquer a kingdom, to give to your relative, and the 
ruler might get an, uh, an indulgence, uh, you know, for some sin for that. Um, so there's all of this uh, complex stuff going on with, with nepotism. And John the 21st, uh, we mentioned him, but the, this is just the start of it. Well, what's funny about this is really it has nothing to do with what the Bible teaches, Scripture. Mm -hmm. It has everything to do with people wanting worldly things in this life. Mm -hmm. uh, the Scripture always says, in several places, but I'll just mention uh, Psalm 17. It says the wicked have their reward now in this life. Right. And so these guys are doing all this stuff, like nepotism and things, uh, armies, whatever, uh, for material gain in this life. Mm -hmm. It's not It's not like they're concerned with what God has to say or the Scripture or anything. They're concerned with what they can get for themselves and their families now right and uh it, it, this seems to be a pattern it, it's like it's like always. they don't believe anything about you know what god judging you or going to heaven or anything like that okay so moving actually behind one thing i forgot about is gregory the ninth who we already discussed in 1239 he ordered raiding all of the jewish synagogues to, to confiscate all the jewish talmuds well the jewish people they have uh, what the Christians would call the Old Testament, they would call the Tanakh, which is the identical to the Old Testament that Protestants use. They have a kind of a commentary on Jewish law and, and Old Testament and law in general called the Talmud. And so he decided that he needed to raid all the synagogues and to uh, confiscate all of those. So Innocent the Five, uh, in his namesake, he was involved with nepotism too. Um, Adrian V, he was a, a nephew of Innocent IV, and he was involved with nepotism. So you see how when you stack relatives on there, and usually, most of the time, a pope was a cardinal before he was a pope. So you get people on the cardinal board, and then they can be pope. And, and there were different factions that uh, supported different popes, the Borgias at various times, the Colonna, um, uh, and, and they, um, it was just a big political value. You know, John XXI. And these are names I'm just throwing out that viewers can um, look on um, the internet and they can find out more about these people. He was 1276-1277, only a year. Uh, Nicholas III, 1277-1280, he was involved with nepotism. Martin IV, 1281-1285, he was involved with nepotism. Now it's interesting here that this papal succession idea that the Roman Catholics even today are so big on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes back to, you know, the guy having sex with somebody and he has a son who later becomes a pope and then you got all this nepotism, interfamily stuff. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't see how any of that is related to what we find in Scripture about the apostles and being ordained and, uh, as elders and deacons in First and Second Timothy. Do you right. see any correlation between what now, we're seeing here and what the Scripture teaches? None whatsoever. I, I guess the, the simplest thing for a Catholic to do is to close their eyes. <laughs> and, well, and, and, and and just say, oh, this doesn't exist, or I don't know anything about well, it. Well, that's what most of them, I think, actually do, because they close their eyes to reading what the Bible says. They don't read what this says in contrast to what's actually going on in that Roman Catholic Right, but, 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 but second, they close their eyes to their own stuff, you know, oh, yes. which is bad. Keating, uh, one thing I like about him <laughs> is that he doesn't completely close his eyes to the bad popes. He is... Well, like about you said, he, he talks about six or seven of them. Right? Yeah, and 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 he meant he only mentions two. They talk about this, and yeah, they were pretty bad. Uh, but but it's like there are all these others too. So so it's like don't downplay the severity of the problem either. Right, but right. Uh, but but at least he he admits there is a problem. Okay, yeah. so let's go back to Innocent the Fourth and let's read some excerpts from the Papal Bull. Uh, now, as far as a Papal teachings and sayings, what Catholics will say is they don't say that everything the Pope says is infallible. And actually, the idea that the Pope is infallible wasn't even an official doctrine until like 1850. 1870. Yeah, 1870. But, 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 but they say that what's official. So if, they, so if the Pope says it's going to rain tomorrow and it didn't rain, um, well, he was wrong, but that's not a problem because he didn't say that officially. All right, so you have ex cathedra statements that are official from supposedly, you know, the, the chair of the Pope, mm -hmm. called Peter's chair, but it was only from the ninth century. Uh, but but there have only been two ex cathedra statements that I've seen. Now, some people say there have been six or seven, but either way, they're not very many. So below that, there's the papal bulls. And so this is an excerpt from one of the of, of the papal bulls called Ad Extra Panda, uh, which talks about the, the Inquisition. 
Mm. And this is in part 24. It says, The head of state and ruler of whatever kind are especially obliged to present all male and female heretics under whatever name they are accused within 50 days after the arrest, so the diocesan or surrogate, or to the inquisitors of heresy to perform the examination of themselves and their heresies. All right, being examined for heresy, by the way, is not something you want to have done to you. <laughs> anyway, Law 24. Those convicted in uh, Law 25.6, the head of state or ruler must force all heretics to whom he has in custody, provided he does so without killing them or breaking their arms or legs as actual robbers and murderers of souls. So how would an emperor treat a robber or murderer? Well, these guys are murderers of souls if they're heretics. So, uh, so they're murderers of souls and thieves of the sacraments of God and Christian faith to confess their errors and accuse other heretics whom they know and specify their motives. So the torture was for two reasons, to get the people to confess their sins, uh, their heresies, and also to get them to name other people as heretics. Mm -hmm. All right. And, of course, the, under torture, they might want to name anyone just to kind of, you know, be free of that. Okay. And, and those whom they have seduced and those whom they have lodged and offended them as thieves and robbers of material goods are made to accuse their accomplices and confess the crimes they have committed. 26.7. And the house in which a male or female heretic shall be discovered shall be leveled with, with the ground, never to be rebuilt, unless it is the master of the house who shall have arranged the discovery of the heretics. So if you have heretics in your house, but you're not a heretic and they're caught and you didn't turn them in, then your house gets leveled anyway. Okay. And if the master of the house owns other houses in the same neighborhood, all the other houses shall be destroyed and the goods shall be found in the house, shall be dispersed to the populace and shall belong to whoever carries them off unless the remover shall be appointed by law. So if you're the master of a house and they're a heretic in your house, you don't report them, that house gets leveled, all your other houses get leveled too because you didn't report the heretic. This sounds kind of like North Korea almost. Yeah, it is. All right. Above all, the master of a house, besides incurring eternal infamy, must pay the government or locality 50 pounds imperial in coin. If unable to pay, he shall suffer life imprisonment. Hmm. This is not the heretic. This is the master of the house who lodged the heretic. The borough where the heretics are arrested or discovered shall pay the government of the state 150 pounds, and the manor shall pay 50, and the regions adjoining manors and states 50. So the local uh, manor or village and, and places around, they all have to pay money to the government if the heretic was found there and wasn't discovered by them. This sounds like a pretty big money grab. It's a big money-making scheme. Yeah. You know, when you're taking money off these papal bulls like this, these phony laws you make up, just to squeeze people for their possessions and their money, mm -hmm. uh, you could add up. Uh, you could you could do a big money grab, like you say, and get a lot of cash. And next thing you know, you could maybe build this big just uh, Sistine Chapel right. that's ornate and full of gold mm -hmm. and, and riches. Yeah, I mean from from this kind of stuff. That's where yeah. yeah. And so Law twenty seven eight. Whoever shall be caught giving any male or female heretic counsel, help, or favor. So even counseling them not to be a heretic would get you in trouble. Besides, the other punishments mentioned duly in logical places and other passages of this decree shall become infamous by the same law and shall be admitted neither to public office nor public affairs nor election of purpose of these, nor may he testify in a legal process. Remember that. That's important. To that extent shall his capacity to testify go that he shall neither bequeath legacies to heirs nor inherit them himself. No one shall be compelled to respond to any business dealings initiated by him, but he shall be so compelled by others. If he be by chance a judge, his sentence shall prove nothing, nor shall he hear any case. If he be an attorney, his defense in court will never be allowed to prevail. If he be a notary, the legal documents drawn up by him shall be utterly without validity. Those who give ear to the false doctrines of heretics shall be punished like heretics. So basically, uh, you don't have support of the public law, and if you have some business dealing, and maybe the other side doesn't keep them their part of the bargain, and you want to take them to the court, if you have helped heretics, not accusing you of being a heretic, but if you've helped heretics, you shall, uh, you know, basically not get be able to say in court. However, if you have a business dealing and someone accuses you of not living up to your side of it, and he takes you to court, well, then again, you know, your your testimony won't really be counted. So this is pretty serious uh, commercially for anybody who even helps heretics. All right. Yes. So this is um, this is from God, according to the Pope, because it was a papal bull. But where do we see that in Scripture? 
Well, n nowhere in Scripture, but when the Catholic says, well, it doesn't matter because the Pope's more important than Scripture, it's like, if you're a Catholic, are you sure you want to defend this? Uh, are you sure you want to defend popes that were successors of this and put this into practice? Otherwise, I don't think that you really want papal succession. Yeah, and from what it looks like, a lot of it has to do with just being a family member that uh, will help you out. Nepotism, as yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. Or all that sex they were having and popes having kids from harlots. Right. I mean, that... that that's kind of a disgusting succession when you really think about it from a biblical perspective. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to put something in, you know, as more important than the Bible, don't put this as more important than the Bible, please. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and for Catholics who, uh, and there are some that know about uh, the problems with past popes mm -hmm. and maybe disgusted with, uh, let's say, Christianity in general, mm -hmm. um, it's like, I understand, but I have to tell you, this isn't Christianity. Mm -hmm. This is uh, evil popes who are using Catholicism uh, for their own ends. And uh, we'll get in, in more of that in, in, in another video. But, but, but this is not the real deal. Uh, you need to go back to the words of God, not these papal bulls. It almost looks like uh, we're reading uh, maybe a, a precursor to The Godfather. Or the, the series of movies. You, I mean, you, you got kind of a crime family. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, at least the mafia people, as I understand it, they wouldn't necessarily kill people's families, you know, if they were mad at somebody. But this guy, you know, these things will go. It will go after the families. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's like, I mean, at least they have more honor than these guys. <laughs> um, it's pretty bad. So, so, so anyway. Uh, now you're saying that Carl Keating didn't mention any of these guys. No, no. He he, he says that it, 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 he he does at least say there's a problem but did he, he says did he that, say anything about the pornoc pornocracy uh all he did what 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 that i saw in these five books is he mentioned he said six or seven popes whom he didn't name and then he, oh, he and, didn't and, name and, them and, and, he only named two popes okay uh uh, uh alexander the sixth and 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 uh one named uh, boniface but but um, we, we haven't even talked about them yet uh we? no we, we, we We're are still getting to yeah, yeah we, we, so uh, all these other boniface people we mentioned eighth. he didn't say a word about no. What their names were. And there's a lot more than six or seven. <laughs> so let's move on to the others. All right. Honorius IV, 1285-1287, uh, nepotism, again. Uh, Nicholas IV, 1288-1292, nepotism. And I'm for the sake of time, I'm just going quickly over these, so you can read more details if you want. Uh, Celestine the Five. Now, technically, he wasn't a, a bad guy as a pope. He was an older guy who was kind of inept. You know, you could say he was a... He was a bad administrator, but he was the only pope. There's some uncertainty about the year, but less than a year. Every single official act that he did was nullified by his successor, the ruthless Boniface VIII. And so Celestine, uh, he resigned, and after he resigned, it looks like he got he was murdered. All right, so Celestine, you know, he's I put him on this list because of the information about him, but Celestine V wasn't bad himself. He was just you know, not really suitable as, as, as a leader, but it's interesting if you believe that the truth hasn't changed, um, and we'll get more, we'll <laughs> shave that with a fine tooth comb later, as Carl Keating does, um, mm -hmm. but his official acts, every single one of them was what was, unoffici was unofficialized. <laughs> okay, so after Boniface became Pope, he ordered a crusade against the Colonna family, who was one of the factions that was, uh, many popes did come from the Colonna family, and um, he wanted to get rid of them. All right, so anyway, he had a, a lot of dealings, I'll put it that way, uh, with the King of France. He wrote the Unum Sanctum, which we will get into later, and the Unum Sanctum is kind of like the peak of papal claims. Anyway, he uh, was imprisoned while he was a pope, and according to official records, he died of chagrin. Chagrin is like regret. So they didn't want to say that they killed him or it was a killing, you know, by starvation or sickness or what, mm -hmm. but while he was imprisoned. Anyway, after he died, 
uh, Benedict XI, uh, 1303 to 1304, he reversed completely Boniface VIII, 1302 Unum Sanctum. So Benedict XI, again, I put him on here just because of the information. Benedict XI, I'm not saying he was a bad guy or not compared to these other popes, but he completely unofficialized what Boniface VIII did. So it's kind of like if, if a pope says something, you say, well, is this official or not? Is this official and unofficialized, or is this still official? It's kind of interesting here, in this case, according to the paperwork uh, that you've been going over, that Boniface VIII unofficialized the previous pope's official decrees. Right, right. And then the guy after Boniface VIII unofficialized right. uh, Boniface VIII's unofficializing of the previous pope's right. official statement. So and it's like they're all just negating each other. Yeah. Now Boniface the Eighth was a generally, you know, one of the worst guys in, in this list. But so on the other hand you say so Benedict the Eleventh, you know, it was good he was there, but how did he succeed from Boniface the Eighth? Well he succeed but now Benedict the Eleventh, make sure this is clear, he did not kill Boniface the Eighth but the people killed Boniface VIII or imprisoned him until he died so that Benedict XI could take power. Mm. So that's papal succession. Again, papal succession so, by murder. So, yeah, so part of papal succession... I always say papal, you say right. papal. We, we all have our ways of saying things. But part of that succession then, as we've learned so far in your history review of these bad popes... Oh, by the way, i got to... For those at home, I, I actually had this book for decades... The bad popes. I bet you, know, too, yeah. They'll have more information about uh, stuff that maybe you might have left out in this, this briefer review. But uh, yeah. uh, the thing about it is we've learned that, uh, well, if you have sex with a harlot and have a child, you can have a pope. Uh, if you're, you have family relations and politics, you can become a, a pope in that succession. And, of course, one of the favorites is, I already knew from our other material we put on YouTube, and I, mentioned, I referenced it earlier, uh, in fact, I think Richard Bennett said there's been at least 75 popes. So, as you're mentioning here, murder is one of the ways of, su uh, of papal succession. So, having sex with some uh, prostitute, uh, family relations and nepotism, uh, money and power, and murder are mm -hmm. all part of the, the chain that leads through all these popes. Anyway. Right. Yeah. All right. So Clement V, he's on here for his information. We don't know that he did anything bad himself, but he was from 1305, 1314. He tried Boniface VIII for heresy and sodomy, and sodomy can refer to homosexuality. Um, now, Boniface was already dead at this time, but to his credit, well, a good thing to say about him is he did not dig up the body uh, like Pope Stephen did. And he so, didn't cut off any fingers. No, of so, 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 okay. so Clement was a good guy for not digging up the body, I guess. Um, but he put him on trial. So when a pope's on trial for heresy, um, that doesn't sound like that was a very good pope to succeed from. Yes. All right. Yes. And Keating has some fascinating things to say about that, that which we'll get in, in when we get in, 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 into the video why Catholics don't need a Pope. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, moving on, because we, we're just kind of skimming the surface of a lot of this and trying to cover all the surface. John the 22nd, uh, 1316, 1334, uh, nepotism. All right. Urban the sixth. He had some enemies. Popes often had enemies. I mean, sometimes they got murdered, and sometimes the Vatican was the fortifications that, you know, they wanted to have to protect them. And some popes left the Vatican and settled in other places for their papacy because it was safer there than in Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, some of the cardinals who were against him, uh, he had them tortured to death, and he actually complained that when they were torturing and their dying screams, he didn't hear enough screaming. That was Urban the Sixth. Yes, 1378 to 1389. Nice guy. Torture and, more, I need to hear more screaming. And you're telling me <laughs> that your Pope succeeded from him? Okay, so that's another... So, so we got sex with prostitutes, we got family relations, we got money and power, armies, uh, and uh, murder, and now uh, we need increased torture uh, yeah. for this papal it's, succession it, to work. More, more, okay. more, more screaming. Well, okay. and, and we're not done yet, by the way. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, Boniface IX, 1350 to 1404, 
he was a practical guy and he was having a problem because uh, warfare in Europe was changing. Uh, if you think about like knights in armor and uh, longbowmen, uh, to be a good longbowman, you kind of need to be trained from a child. Anyway, to have these uh, armies of good soldiers, it was starting to cost a lot of money. You just couldn't take a bunch of peasants and yep. give them swords and have them be a good force anymore. So he had to, um, you know, have a good army too. And that was costing money. And the Vatican at that time was very strapped for cash. So he sold what's called clerical benefices to the higher bidder. So uh, you want to be a, arch a bishop, you want to be an archbishop, you want to be a cardinal, uh, and you don't really know the Pope, uh, Pope Boniface says, well, okay, you can be. How much money you got? <laughs> okay, so this was the office of the, quote, church. So now that's, an, we add that list, now you add money, lots of money. Right can get you where you need to be. Yeah, 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 but 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 he would do something a little different than the others. So let's say you uh, putting in in today's terms. Um, let let's say you gave seventy thousand dollars to be Archbishop of somewhere, and the Pope said, "Okay, shook your hand. We got a deal. Uh, where's the seventy thousand? Okay, so you get collecting the seventy thousand. Then some other guy comes in later and says, "Well, I want. I'll do it for eighty thousand." All right, well, then the 70,000 guy is no longer going to be archbishop. Mm -hmm. And it was unclear to me if he actually got his 70,000 back or not. Yeah, that can be a real problem. Uh, so he would void his sale, and I, I'm, I'm not actually sure each way, you know, which way they got it back. So anyway, so, so he was, you know, he had a human problem. How do he, he get better weapons and, and a more equipped army? He solved it with a human solution, sell yes. it. Yeah. Um, what does God have well, to do with this? Absolutely nothing. What, you don't see all these big prayers, I need more money for my army, Lord, let's have a great prayer. Instead, he comes up with this plan. Right. Of course, why should we be praying for more money for the army in the first place? But <laughs> maybe it's this has nothing to do with the true church of, of God. This is just the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. Uh, the next one, uh, many popes uh, were, and we have a, a whole show on this and a lot of research on the um, persecution of Jewish people by the Roman Catholics. Martin V, though, in 1470 and 1431, he actually did not persecute the Jews. So the Roman Catholic Church was kind of inconsistent on that, which was probably good news for many Jewish people. However, he launched a crusade against the Wycliffeites, also called Lollards. And Wycliffe was an English man. He had the translation of, of the Wycliffe Bible. It actually, he organized it. He didn't translate it himself. And given his flowery style of writing, maybe that was a good thing. But he was a good guy. And these guys named Lollards, um, they were actually kind of ridiculed in England because they would go out to some public place or something like that or some corner outside or whatever. And all they would do is they would just read the Bible out loud. Just stand on a street corner and start reading the Bible. Right. And, so uh, the general public could hear the Word of God. Right. Uh, they, 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 you know, some people criticize them for not being the theologically most sophisticated. Um, they didn't pretend to be. They just said, well, let's just see what God's Word said. Let's see what, 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 what Jesus you know, and, and the Gospel writers and, and, and them all said. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Martin responded to that initiative by ordering a crusade against them. You know, this was to be the prerogative of the priest. Not, no one should be going out and reading the Bible to other people. So just go out there, get your army out there, and get rid of them. Doesn't even have to be the army. The, the priests themselves can, can torture them and kill them. Mm. All right. Nicholas the, the Fifth in 1447 to 1455, he was then was to pope. In 1452, he had a papal bull called Dom de Versus and a 1455 bull called Romanus Pontifex. All right, now this authorized the capturing of slaves, and this was very important, especially to the Portuguese and mm -hmm. also to the Spanish. So he said it's fine to capture people who are not slaves and to make them into slaves, and it's fine to sell slaves and do everything else. And this is not the Pope saying, this is my opinion. This is an official capital bull. This is as official as it gets in the Catholic Church below ex cathedra. All right. Now, he did have one qualification set. You can only make slaves out of non-Christians. Okay. So if they're Christians, you couldn't do it. But watch out if you're a non-Christian and then the Spanish or Portuguese are coming. Now, that kind of reminds me of Islam. In Islam, 
you, you know, Muhammad said, you, whoever your right hand possesses, the, 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 can yeah, the, your slave. The, the, the women your right hand possess are like women for um, who are non-wives for sexual relations, uh, but, but, but they would capture and enslave people, uh, uh, especially infidels. Later on, much after Muhammad, they would capture fellow Muslims too and kill them. Uh, but 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 uh, it it does have some you know you would be tempted to say oh this is a bad thing they learned from Muslims, but actually I don't think that's the case. Uh, if you think slavery is wrong, which I do, <laughs> and hopefully you do too, um, then I would say this papal bull is baloney. Uh, and this papal bull is, un is ungodly to say, I can go and make slaves out of people with, with, with papal approval, um, you know, uh, well, uh, especially you know, if I'm Portuguese or Spanish and, and, and of non-Christians. Well, if I could say something along these lines, I, I would say that these papal bulls, not just baloney, but our, our bull, mm -hmm. uh, because they are not saying, and they were, they were, they are actually contradicting, contradicting what the Word of God says. Okay. Our whole perspective, our whole ministry is here to present the Word of God, mm. and the truth of God, and the Scriptures themselves teach that Old right. Testament, New Testament. I mean, Jesus Himself said. This is the word of God. Yeah. <laughs> but these guys here are coming up with their bull statements that are, it's like whatever Jesus said doesn't matter. We're mm -hmm. going to just say what we want because we got political motives. We got ideas that we want to get done. We need money. Yeah. Whatever and, it has to, but it has nothing to do with Jesus and the prophets. Right. And, and some Catholics say, well, the church gave the Bible. So that's why the church teachings are more important than the Bible. Well, I don't agree that the church gave the Bible. I, I really think God gave the Bible. Of course he now, did. Now, now, early Christians who are not Catholic, uh, they recognize God's word. We owe them a debt for that. But, you know, it, 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 it's really, you know, are you focused on God or are you focused on these, uh, you know, baloney of, of the popes and, the, and, the, and a particular church? Well, the scripture itself teaches... It didn't take a Roman Catholic church to produce the Word of God. Right. It was already there, Old Testament, the Jewish Scripture, that was all there already. Mm -hmm. And then you find like in Second Peter chapter 3, verse uh, uh, 16, uh, it talks about how this, the words of Paul are Scripture. Right. Uh, so you've got Luke writing all this stuff down mm -hmm. in the book of Acts, uh, and uh, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, you have these references in the Scriptures themselves saying that there's your Scriptures right there because what Paul says, and even Paul himself said in, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, the words I say are the, 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 the commands of the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have the documentation for what we have in scripture going right back to the first church early church right but 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 so beyond the bible if i had a choice of um following what the popes say or nothing um i'd rather go with nothing uh you know let's just go with what the bible says i'm gonna just play a little quick clip here from that video for folks at home to see what how important the word of god is to jesus and then uh, i'll come right back and then we'll we'll get back into this Facts and evidences. Number one, Genesis chapter one states, God said nine times. It's interesting in Genesis chapter three, where the serpent, the devil, actually questions, hath God said? Point two, Malachi says, thus says the Lord, 23 times, God speaks from Genesis to Malachi. Point three, the Lord spoke appears 560 times in the first five books of the Bible alone. Point four, Isaiah claimed his message came directly from God 40 times. Ezekiel claimed that his message came from God 60 times. Jeremiah claims his message came from God 100 times, at least 3,800 times in the Old Testament, quote, the Lord spoke, end quote, appears. Point five, Jesus quoted from 24 Old Testament books alone. The quotes are still the same today. They have not been lost in transmission. Examples, Jesus believed Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. 
Matthew chapter 19, verses 8 and 9. John chapter 7, verse 19. Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. Jesus believed Isaiah was a prophet. That's found in Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 21. Cross-reference that with Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 2. Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9. Cross-reference that with Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus believed Daniel to be a prophet. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Mark chapter 13, verse 14. Jesus believed in the Adam and Eve account. Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. Jesus believed the great flood and Noah accounts. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37. Luke chapter 17, verse 26. Jesus believed the Sodom and Gomorrah accounts. Matthew chapter 11, verse 24. Luke chapter 17, 28 through 29. Jesus believed the accounts concerning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Luke chapter 20, verse 37. Matthew chapter 22, verse 32. Jesus believed in the Jonah and the great fish account. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 and following. Jesus believed the Old Testament was the word of God, authoritative and without error. Matthew chapter 23, verse 35. Luke chapter 24, verses 27 and 44. Matthew chapter 26, verse 54. Luke chapter 16, verse 17. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Luke 11, verse 51. Luke 17, 29, and also 32. Matthew 24, 15, 34, and 18. Mark chapter 12, verse 26. John chapter 6, 31, 32. Also John chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus passed the same authority of the Old Testament to the New Testament. John 14, 26, John 15, 26 through 27, John 16, verses 12 through 15. Jesus believed the Psalms were inspired by God. Luke chapter 20, verse 21 through 44, John chapter 10, verse 34, cross-reference that with Psalm 82, verse 6. To summarize, Jesus simply believed the Bible was the Word of God, Old Testament, New Testament. And anyone that doesn't believe in the Bible as the Word of God, the inspired Word of God, doesn't believe Jesus. And if they don't believe in Jesus, they cannot be saved. Remember, the way to shoot the head off the devil and his multitude of lies is with the sure Word of God. In Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, Jesus defeated the devil three separate times by rebuking the devil with the word of God. Jesus said, quote, It is written in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus said, and he answered, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus responded to the devil's second temptation. Jesus responded again, It is written, Matthew chapter 4. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And on the devil's final temptation in this section of Scripture, Jesus rebuked the devil a third time in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, saying, Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That's a reference from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. So moving on, let's look at Sixtus IV. He was from 1471 to 1484. He was involved in nepotism. He made three nephews, one grandnephew, and one other relative, all cardinals. So that's uh, five cardinals. He also had the bull Exeget Sinceri Devotionis Affectus. These bulls are written in Latin, and so that's why Latin titles. And this was to spread the Spanish Inquisition to Castile, which is now in, in Spain. He had the Venetians attack the city of Ferrara in Italy so that he could give the city to his nephew to rule. 
He sold offices and privileges for money. We've heard that before. He promoted the Immaculate Conception. This is a Catholic doctrine that Mary uh, was conceived without sin and was born basically with a sinless nature. He also confirmed Nicholas V's bulls for the Portuguese to enslave non-Christians. All right. Oh, just for a clarification, you're talking about the Immaculate Conception that Mary was born. Yes. Without a sin nature. Right. Sort of like what Pelagius was talking about for everybody. Right. Except they did it for Mary here. Maybe he wasn't as bad at, 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 as uh, Alexander the Sixth or Boniface the Eighth, but, you know, he's still a bad pope. Okay. Um, so I never really figured out from Carl Keating who, you know, if he has six or seven, then who are the other four or five? Well, we have a pretty big list to choose from. <laughs> well, it's pretty obvious. He's counting on the fact and I, you know, I've said this for years, for decades, mm -hmm. that a lot of these Roman Catholic apologists are counting on the fact that most people are going to be too lazy to look up the early church fathers or look into all this history like you've been going into. Mm -hmm. And so when Carl Keating mentions a couple of popes and then leaves you to wonder about the rest of them, he's just figuring, well, good, you know, they'll, they'll never yeah. check it. I'll, I'll, I'll just say yeah, maybe, this. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's, I wouldn't accuse them all of being too lazy, maybe too trusting of humans who are, you know, in for power. It's selective. It's a yeah. He's presenting just parts of the, the puzzle right, that he right. wants people to listen to, and he leaves out the rest. Yeah. So Pope Innocent VIII, an, another innocent guy, uh, 1484 to 1492, he appointed Torquemada as an inquisitor. This is in the Spanish Inquisition. Of all the inquisitors, Torquemada was probably one of the most famous um, for torture. He endorsed the burning witches with his papal bull, uh, Sumus Deserantis Affectibus, in 1484, witch burnings and things like that, which were, you know, an ugly thing that Catholics as well as Protestants did. It's like, well, that's kind of where the precedent came from. All right, Alexander the Sixth, 1492 to 1503. This is the bad pope, and this is one of the ones that Keating mentions. He was involved with nepotism. He made 25,000 ducats, Italian money, by allowing the king of Hungary to divorce his wife. He allowed Charles the Eighth of France to marry someone betrothed to another. So they're already engaged to somebody else, but Charles the Eighth of France could marry them anyway because France was more useful to the papacy. And so it's starting to be a thing about where kings um, could basically have whatever they want, a marriage annulled, or whatever happened, as long as they were supporting the papacy. And of course, all that violates scripture when right. it gets into marriage. And and patrols, especially in the Old Testament, I yeah. mean, it just, just, but, but, they're just totally ignoring what the Scripture says. Yeah, but, but I mean, there have been other annulments, like, uh, of ordinary Catholics, where they've been married for 20 years, mm -hmm. and they've had children, and of course, if they're divorced, then they can't take communion anymore in the Catholic Church, and so they've gone to the church, and the church said, fine, we don't get a divorce, I mean, the, in the legal law, it's a divorce, but in the church law, um, mm -hmm. we'll just call it an annulment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And whether it's in a, a, a call, the church calls a divorce where you can't take uh, Lord's Supper again or they call an annulment kind of depends upon if you're in good with the church. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Leo X, 1513 to 1521, he was a spendthrift who emptied the treasury. He spent something like, you know, more than a tenth of the entire Vatican treasury just on one ceremony. Okay. <laughs> he sounds like some of our uh, modern day politicians that just want to spend in deficit spending right. into the trillions of dollars. So it's like, it doesn't yeah. matter if we And have then a you have a budget. jubilee or a, or a, a special indulgence or something to make yeah, it that yeah, much. Yeah. All right, uh, Julius II, he's been nicknamed the Warring Pope. All right, he looted Italian cities. He noticed conquered them, but conquered them in order to get all the riches to right. fill, refill the, the Vatican that got emptied by Leo X. Well, that's so typical. If you know world history and one of my fields of uh, endeavor and hobbies as I document in my personal testimony video on uh, testimony of a dungeon master. I used to be into writing for war gaming magazines and stuff. Before and you were a Christian. Lot of these, yeah. Yeah, before I was a Christian. And uh, one thing you find about in military history is a, a lot of these dictators, and we're not talking religion here, we're just talking worldly dictators, Genghis Khan or, mm -hmm. or whoever, you know, Stalin or whoever it might be, but... Uh, they're just in it to take over somebody so they can get their money and possessions. Uh -huh. You know, uh, that was that was Hit Hitler doing stuff like that too. You just get a lot of money by just rolling over some country, taking their treasury. 
and added it to your own. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. Conquerors all through ages have done that, and if and a the conqueror, no it, if it's called a pope, it's not. It's the yeah, same. he's just I, doing I, what I, the I, rest I, of them do. So, so <laughs> interesting. Some Catholics would um, view church councils as uh, higher than the pope. And mm -hmm. other Catholics would view the Pope higher than church councils, and some might put them kind of equal. Yeah, yeah. Well, in 1511, there was a church council that suspended Julius XI, basically deposed him from being Pope. Mm -hmm. But Julius XI and his army uh, <laughs> just ignored that church council. So, well, the army helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're going to ignore something, that always helps. So, 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 so much mm -hmm. for the importance of church councils. Uh, now, when the Pope agrees with the Church Council, then it doesn't matter. But when yeah. he disagrees, then right, where do you go right, with it? Right, right. So anyway, uh, again, uh, success, Popes after him, they succeeded from this guy. And when you're talking about papal succession, uh, you're saying that, that your leader succeeded from this guy. I'm not sure I would uh, be too proud about talking about papal succession here. <laughs> That's um, right. So well, you're showing all the patterns on how it, how it works. The well, real yeah, way yeah. in reality, in yeah. history, and, and, that papal and, succession works. It yeah. works in all these ways we've been discussing. And, and again, I'm just going fast to, to, to skim the surface. You can look in the details of all these popes later. All right, and so Leo X, uh, again, the treasury was still loan money, 1513 to 1521. So he granted special indulgences to donors who donated money to rebuild Cedars Basilica. Mm -hmm. Okay. He excommunicated Martin Luther for being bad, I guess. He also expanded the Spanish Inquisition into Portugal. Okay. Uh, well, there's some major events right there. Yeah. And so Clement VII, 1523 to 1534, he was involved in a lot of political dealings with France, Spain, and Germany, often pitting one against the other and involved in the politics and fighting. And here's the deal. I'm not at all defending Henry VIII. But he indicated that when Henry VIII wanted an annulment, that he would support his annulment so he could go marry somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then he forbade it. Now, Henry VIII got pretty mad about that because all these other kings, they got annulments to do what they wanted. That's right. And so the Pope now stands up and says, no, you can't do that. That, that would be a divorce. You have to stay with her. He's being hypocritical to his own predecessors. Yes. Uh, as popes. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's probably one reason that really, like you just said, got... Henry VIII mad. Yeah, and and, and this and, is no, this isn't fair. And Everyone so, else gets to do it. Yeah, and, <laughs> and and so and now Henry VIII was uh you know so he killed some of his wives and and eventually he forbade Catholic priests. Catholic priests eventually got uh, forbidden in England and and um, uh, Thomas More uh, you know uh, had you know suffered persecution from him for that and he started the Anglican Church in which the head of the Anglican Church. Uh, was basically Henry the Eighth or, 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 yeah, or the yeah, king. Yeah. And a long time ago, when I was growing up, uh, for a while we were, went to an Episcopal church and I went through their confirmation. Mm -hmm. And what I learned uh, from the confirmation class mm -hmm. was that the Catholic church was started by Jesus Christ and the Episcopal church, which came from the Anglican church, that was also started by Jesus Christ. <laughs> Not a single peep about Henry the Eighth. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. sometimes what you learn in a catechism class or whatever can be kind of selective here. Uh, you mean like, uh, like this this book here? The Catholic it's catechism. Selective. Yeah. Uh, oh. which, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, they kind of. It's not only what's in the book, it's what's uh, silent about, too. But anyway. Well, it's funny to me that uh, Henry VIII and his situation just started his own church. Okay, if you're not going to let me have it my way, I'll just start my own. Right, right. And, 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 and the they don't even mention it. Yeah. yeah. He's the founder. And, and, the, Angli and the Anglican Church, it, it's been called uh, Protestant by uh, some Catholics, but it's not really Protestant. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not really Catholic either. It's just okay. it's just Anglican. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway, Paul the Fourth, he just one of the many things with uh, against Jews. He made the Jews in Rome wear distinctive clothing, like blue star or whatever, and live in a ghetto. So they had to live in their own area with only one entrance and exit. Uh, he set up the Roman Inquisition as opposed to the Italian Inquisition. Uh, he opposed any dialogue with Protestants. So some Catholics were thinking, well, why don't we have a council? And uh, yes, Martin Luther, um, you know, isn't, you know, doesn't, there's not good blood between him and Calvin and the Catholics. Why don't we have a council? Why don't we invite them to come? And why don't we see if we can work all this out? Mm -hmm. Okay. Pope Paul IV was uh, totally against that. Right. No dialogue with him whatsoever. 
Okay, Pius IV, from 1599 to 1565, he was rebuked to his face by Pope Pius V for nepotism. Oh, man, that's a, that's a papal succession tradition. Right, yeah. And he's getting mad about something that's been going on for centuries? About a papal tradition, yeah. And he was rebuked when he wanted to make a 13-year-old relative a cardinal. Did you say 13-year-old relative? You mentioned this earlier yeah. in the video. Yes. But. So, so, so a cardinal, which is kind of the highest position in the Catholic Church, uh, below the Pope, mm -hmm. uh, think of the, you know, you would think the experience and the age and the wisdom mm -hmm. or whatever that ought to be in a cardinal, mm -hmm. in a 13-year-old. <laughs> um, it's kind of like, uh, well, he was rebuked for that, but that's what the Pope decided. All right, now, here's something that we'll take a little explaining. He let the lady have the communion cup in Austria and Bohemia. Okay. Now that's unusual. Now, um, here's the, the, the deal. Lady means people who are uh, the, the Catholics or whatever. Who are, not the who, are, who are not the priests. And they say that the, uh, body and, uh, that the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. And technically, the bread becomes the body and blood, and the, and the wine becomes the body and blood, and any little piece is the entire body and blood. And so, because uh, they didn't want to have any um, irregularities, I guess, um, they would let the, the lady have the uh, bread, but not the communion wine. So the, the lady gets the bread, which is the body, that's all and they the get. And the wine is the blood. They, they, yeah. So and, they're and only they, getting they, half the deal. Well, they're not getting the whole deal. Yes. Now their argument is, well, if the, the, if the bread and wine are both turned into all body and blood, therefore they're getting the whole deal because they just get the bread. Um, now, the, <laughs> now the priests get both. And so it's like, it's like making a farce out, out, out of the Last Supper that That's Jesus right. had. So anyway, but, but this guy was nice. He, uh, he, he let the uh, lady, the non-priest, have the cup also, at least in Austria and, and next door in Bohemia. Bohemia is kind of the modern Czech it was, Republic. It was too politically uh, incorrect for him to do that, probably in Italy. Yeah. Because and, uh, and, and, the tradition and, was so ingrained that... But he could get away with it in these other countries. Right. And in the Bohemia, now the Czech Republic, there were problems ever since the Council of Constance, uh, I guess, revolts and the Hussites and all that stuff. So he yeah. probably did that to kind of, you know, placate them a little bit. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, under Urban the Thirteenth in 1623-1644, Galileo was tried under him. And without going into Galileo's trial, uh, let me just say that, that, that it was a kind of a complicated situation. Uh, in some ways, Galileo was kind of a jerk, uh, <laughs> uh, see, but but I'll just say that you know really that's uh, under church thing about your views about you know the 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 sun and the and all that. Uh, anyway, he was the last pope to expand the papal states through military action, so he used the pope the papal armies to so expand also. As we're looking at these popes as we go down the line, uh, it's a lot of repetition of. Evils the uh, popes before them did. It's just a lot of the same typical stuff. Yes. You know, I mean, this guy's using armies to mm -hmm. to conquer lands and set up things and take money and everything else. Yep. Clement the Eleventh, Papal Bull Unigenitus in 1713. Now this is an interesting Papal Bull uh, because there were these people around at this time. They they were Catholics called Jansenists. Mm -hmm. J-E-N-S-E-N-I-C-S. One of the most famous Jansenists was this brilliant French mathematician and scientist named Blaise Pascal. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Pascal, he wrote a lot of stuff on fluid dynamics that you can still study today in, in engineering uh, and edu education. Uh, he also wrote stuff on uh, witnessing to Muslims. Uh, he also had the famous thing called Pascal's Wager, kind of a yes. lighthearted uh, tongue twister, you might say. Uh, and, and he wrote a, a lot of stuff on, on theology. And anyway, the, the Jensenists were, uh, they were, uh, they've been described as Calvinistic Catholics. All right, they weren't Protestants. Uh, but anyway, they were kind of a, a, a group within Catholicism. And later, they were considered um, a heresy and they were persecuted. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a list of, um, uh, uh, of things that either the, Gen the Jensenists said or else ca ca other Catholics claimed the Jensenists said because the people who really hated the Jensenists were the Jesuits. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there was a list, uh, and it's a little unclear about if they actually said this or if it was actually um, just claimed they said it. And so this papal bull lists some of these things, and it anathemizes them or says these are cursed. 
some of the things that uh, Clement XI said, these were cursed, is if you say these things, the church or the whole Christ has the incarnate word as his head, but all the saints as members. I don't see anything wrong with that. But anyway, the reading of the sacred scripture is for all. Clement XI and his papal bull anathematize that. The sacred obscurity of the word of God is no reason for the laity to dispense themselves from reading it. So this is saying just because some parts of the word of God may be uh, difficult to uh, understand is no reason to stop reading it. Mm -hmm. All right, so they anathematize that. It is an illusion to persuade himself that knowledge of the mysteries of religion should not be communicated to women by the reading of sacred scripture. Not from the simplicity of women, but from the proud knowledge of men has arisen the abuse of scripture by which heresies have been born. So this statement is saying that don't forbid women from hearing about scripture because actually the abuse of scripture and heresies, they pretty much come from men more than women. Mm -hmm. All right, so anyway, Pope Clement XI anathematized that. Mm -hmm. All right, another statement, uh, maybe a little bit of an edge to it. To snatch away from the hands of Christians the New Testament, or to hold it closed against them by taking away from them the means of understanding it, is to close for them the mouth of Christ. Man, he, this, this Pope just doesn't like anything to where people are going to have access to the Word of God, the nope. Scriptures. <laughs> and he's, he's going right after it. And making sure that people can't get this access. Right. Men all, or women all, all or women. Only get it through the priest. Yeah. All right. The other one, nothing engenders a worse opinion of the church among our enemies than to see their exercise an absolute rule over the faith of the faithful and to see divisions fostered because of matters uh, which do not violate faith or morals. So this statement is saying that it looks bad for the church and the enemies see this to see divisions just because of things which don't violate faith or morals. Anyway, Pope Clement XI anathemized that. Mm -hmm. And these are quoted from a Catholic writer, Gary Wills, Why I'm a Catholic, page 182 to 183. In fact, you showed the book to the, the, the viewers earlier in this right. video. So. Right. Uh, Clement XI, I would rate him as pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> not, he's he's anti-scripture. He's yeah, anti-word yeah, of yeah, God, yeah. anti-evangelist. Right. Now, I, I don't have any evidence that he's involved in sexual immorality or nepotism or killing people or uh, sacking cities or stuff like that, but he was bad for what he wrote. But each one of those things you just listed, though, is part of papal succession according yes. to the history we're doing. Right. Okay. And then Leo the, the 12th, who was maybe a century after him, 1823, 1829, he condemned uh, being a part of Bible society. <laughs> you know, and Bible societies, they aren't really out to teach theology. They're out to uh, publish the Bible and to make it freely available. You right. know, one of the more famous ones, uh, a good one, is the Gideons that often put Bibles in, in hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like Pope Leo the 12th was against that. Well, I've often said that one reason Roman Catholicism throughout the centuries and so forth has been so against the promulgation of the Word of God to the masses mm -hmm. is because it would immediately expose their organization mm -hmm. to be, of being false, of being yeah. not what the Bible teaches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's one reason you have to do that. And it's like in a lot of communist countries, um, you've got to suppress the other side because communism... Uh, wants only one view, right. their view, and look no bad. other view. Yeah. And Roman Catholicism is much the same way. Okay. So, so Pius IX, from 1846 to 1848, he was a pope who wrote to persecute Jews. However, he also, in 1864, wrote about politics, about uh, the separation of church and state, and why that was wrong. And I was reading from a Catholic source, uh, it was not Keating, it was somebody else, um, who said that, that, that the, you know, the, the Catholicism has always uh, uh, tolerated separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. Again, baloney. All right, and he said that Catholicism should be in the state religion and lands with the majority of Catholics. And he was also against Bible societies, and he also mm -hmm. supported the papal states. Yes, yes. Okay, so Pius X, 1903 to 1914, he had informants to hunt out heretics in the Catholic Church. All right, so that is kind of secret police in Catholic churches. All right, so Gary Wills, on page uh, 208 and 209, he calls his pontificate the reign of terror. 
And because of his views on the state and government, uh, many governments cut off government funds to the Catholic Church in their country because Pius X would not recognize them because they recognized Italy, and Italy took over the Papal States. In 1906, um, he wrote the papal bull Vehementer Nos, condemning the 1905 French law that separated church and state. So he had nothing to do with the French government because they recognized Italy and they said you should separate that. So at first he banned tango dancing, uh, but later he changed. So it's like, you know, you think about, you know, some people today are all against dancing. Well, the, uh, the Pope Pius X was one of them. But, uh, when he, but when they talk about the infallibility of the Pope, and this is already after that, and in these statements, they he can he can go against tango dancing, and declare it evil. But then he can change his mind later, and it's fine, even though he's an, an infallible Pope according to the 1870 degrees yeah. in the Roman Catholic Church, and because he didn't say it ex cathedra from the from the chair. But well, well, also, and we'll go into this more with uh, in in the why Catholics don't need a pope. Uh, the Carl Keating says is well infallible in uh, in in faith and morals, but not in practices. Right. So so, so they'd say for that. one day tango dancing. No, no, that's a. Did he ever specify whether it was a, a, a venial sin or a mortal sin to commit? Uh, I, 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 no, I don't know. You didn't study in that much detail now. Yeah. But it's interesting to me for viewers at home is, you know, like, for instance, this guy does such in-depth research. I thought I'd ask him such a technical, because a lot of times he can answer a question like that. But just looking at his notes here, just on this one book by Keating, I mean, he does this with everything he does. It's incredible. I mean, who else can do this kind of stuff uh, for most people out there? But uh, so I thought maybe Steve would even know if <laughs> tango dancing in the Roman Catholic Church was a venial sin or a moral sin. But the thing, the thing is, though, is if you, if you go back to what Pius X wrote, it won't matter because some other pope may have uh, unofficially would abrogate it, get rid of it. it yeah. So one, and that's another uh, pattern of papal succession is. One pope can de uh, uh, decommit or you know deactivate uh, yeah unof that was the word I was looking for unofficialize whatever a pope or two said before him mm -hmm. and so it can go back and forth it's like dominoes on a table my grandfather loves to play dominoes and those day those dominoes are shifting all over the place right and it just comes down to whatever pope uh, picks up the dominoes and whatever he's got in his hand yep. is how it's going to be for that moment. But then the minute he's gone, you got to reshuffle those dominoes and no telling what the next guy is going to draw. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, I mean, for example, a, a, a Joan of Arc, uh, who, uh, you know, the I guess French uh, a, a patriot, you know, who thought that the British, you know, the English shouldn't like rule France. Um, she was um, uh, convicted of heresy and burned at the stake. Um, and of course, if you were a heretic and burned at the stake, according to Catholicism, you'd go to hell. Okay, well, and, and the Pope, coincidentally, was English. Uh, yes, but yes. 50 years later, um, the trial, another Pope, that the trial was considered void, and she was okay, and then many centuries later, she was beautified, and now is called a saint. Exactly. So it's like, so did this saint spend time in hell, or was that English Pope wrong? Exactly. You know, and, See, and, 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 and the English Pope, actually, he wasn't the one that pronounced it, but he didn't rescind it. He didn't uh, say anything against it. Mm -hmm. and, and those flames that killed her probably felt pretty official. Yes, yes. Um, so, so, so. These are just more patterns than what we're seeing in this papal succession. Right. And it looks to be a pretty grisly, terrible, greedy, miserable type of uh, succession compared to what we find in the Scripture. When it's right. a godly situation. Yeah, and, and so going back to Pope Pius the, the tenth, though, he opposed trade unions unless they were Catholic only. So didn't want to have any trade unions for workers' rights if they included non-Catholics also. Mm. Okay, so kind of a religious bigotry there. Yes. He refused to meet with U.S. officials uh, because the U.S. officials had already had also met with Methodist officials, and if he would, they would meet with another denomination, he wouldn't meet with them at all. Okay, his uh, 1905 catechism that he wrote, it taught the concept of limbo, uh, where babies who died, they would go to limbo. Okay, now the Catholic Church uh, in the like, 80s, uh, set, 1980s, uh, said that limbo is no longer true. 
So he taught something in his, it wasn't a papal bull, it wasn't an ex cathedra, but it was what Catholics say is incorrect doctrine. Now limbo is about babies, right? Yeah, uh, it, about those who never heard. Yeah, including babies. Okay, so it's it's interesting to me because as I, on something like limbo, let's say, mm -hmm. okay, he's saying it is true and all that, but then they change it later. And it just reminds me of a lot of these cults out there, or particularly... When Mormonism. I had, well, Mormonism and uh, particularly Jehovah's Witnesses, mm. which I've had a lot of uh, uh, expertise in, and we've done a lot of videos on it, just showing how the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Jehovah's Witnesses does the same thing these Roman Catholics do. They they say this is true here, but then down the line, in another one of their books or one of their right. other presidents, they change it completely. You know, one one uh, Jehovah's Witness uh, president uh, uh uh, Rutherford, Judge Rutherford mm -hmm. in the 1930s said that devils can be saved. Mm. <laughs> you know, but then later he yeah. said, "No, no, that's not true. We don't want that. We don't want that." And and we can use ancient Egyptian pyramids to predict the end of the world. And and then later ones say, "No, no, we can't <laughs> do that." And uh, you know, are the are the uh, the the men of Sodom and Gomorrah going to be resurrected? Well, one Jehovah's Witness book in the 1870s says yes. And another one later on, 20, 30 years later, says no, and it goes back and forth yeah. for a hundred years. But 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 but, <laughs> but that's what happens when you're, uh, um, I guess, ruled by fallible men, and and scripture isn't your highest authority. That's but, right. but but another thing the Roman Catholics have, have done uh, is, is that um, he had a papal directive called motu proprio, and it banned women from singing in church choirs. So so according to Pope Pius X, women can't sing in in any Catholic church choirs. Well, women do sing today, so yes. so I guess they've made a Pope movie Pius about the those. Wrong. They even made a movie about those singing nuns back in the early '60s, that famous French singing mm -hmm. nun lady, and they're all singing together and stuff like that. So, but back, if they had been came out with that song back here, they wouldn't yeah. be able to do it at all. Right, and and then Pope Pius XI, uh, he he was another pope that was uh, 1922 to 1939. He was anti-Semitic, and he said. First half sounds good that the state should not be totalitarian. Of course, this is the time during World War, you know, after World War One and, and before World War Two. He said it shouldn't be totalitarian. It should be the Catholic Church. And a little then, biased there. Yeah, yeah. Now Pope Pius the Twelfth is kind of um, he's on this list not so much for what he did, but for what he didn't do. Uh, from 1939 to 1958. Now this was a time, terrible time of, yes. of World War Two. Uh, during World War II, at, at, at the start of the war, um, Hitler killed uh, many uh, Protestant pastors who would speak out against him. Mm -hmm. uh, he also killed many Catholic priests and stuff that he would uh, speak out also against Jehovah's him. Also Jehovah's Witnesses, homosexuals. So he was kind of against all of them. And Pope Pius XII, he failed to speak out against the Holocaust until after World War II. In fact, you can watch the History Channel. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of a history buff, so I've caught some of these shows uh, about uh, Pope Pius XII here from World War II and the dealings he had with the Nazis mm -hmm. during this time. Now, I'm, I'm not saying this. I'm just saying that's what they've got on the History Channel, and there's a couple of History Channels on the cable uh, the networks we have here. Mm -hmm. Probably get it on uh, Direct TV, Dish Network, and stuff like that. But anyway, they document a lot of these actual deals he had made with the Nazis during that period of time. Yeah, I'm not claiming that, that he was necessarily for the Nazis, but, you know, again, the human problem with his evils here, and he tried to deal with it with a human way, and he probably thought it wasn't opportune or best to speak out against it. Mm -hmm. But then, after World War II, he claimed that he spoke out against it. And Gary Wells, a Catholic uh, writer, calls him on this in his book of Why I'm a Catholic, page 3. Mm -hmm. So, if you felt it best to be silent about that, you know, while it was happening, um, maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong, but regardless, don't lie and claim you spoke out against it if you really didn't. Mm -hmm. This is just kind of, kind, kind of a... A uh, very brief overview of why there are more than six or seven bad popes. Okay, um, and um, so it, I thought it was funny though that Keating only mentioned two names, left out yeah. the other ones, yeah. and, and hardly said any, uh, almost anything of what we've been talking about.
Yeah, and, and, and he didn't say what the two really did. And, and I've read every page of, of, of these five books, and unless I missed it, um, that's the only two mentioned. And, and that he, he kind of he does mention it to his credit, but he just glosses over it and, and, and minimizes it. And frankly, this is pretty bad. And it's like, you know, if you really wanted to believe in pap papal succession, uh, don't believe you, you succeeded, from, you know, your leader succeeded from these guys. Right. You right. know. Um, yeah, and any, any uh, church worth its biblical roots would kick out any of these popes you've just outlined over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't qualify as an elder. They have to be above reproach. Right. According to the scripture, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, elders and deacons, all of them would be, they couldn't even be a pastor of a church, let alone a pope. Or couldn't remain, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they'd be, they'd be booted out because they're not fulfilling the biblical requirements. Yeah, so, 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 so let's put this in, in a little perspective. All right, some of these popes and, and under them, many cardinals and, and some of the priests were um, pretty bad people. All right, what happened to them? Um, they remain in power. Uh, a lot of people, um, in, now on, on, in contrast to that, there are other, you know, people, there are, let's say, pastors in, in um, you know, in evangelical, you know, you know, churches that some of them, unfortunately, do bad things too. What happens to them? Uh, they are fired, they get kicked out, sometimes they're arrested, all right, but they aren't shuffled uh, from one parish to another and it's not swept under the rug. And one thing that people say positive about Pope Francis is that um, he is trying to deal with the um, sexual abuse. And I've heard that he's actually told some Catholic priests who have been involved, you know, in the sex abuse scandals that you are no longer a Catholic priest. All right. So on one hand, yes, that is a good thing. But on the other hand, how come the other popes didn't do that? That's right. That's right. And are you getting that information from... Uh Carl Keating. Uh, no, the, 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 uh, the, uh, that part was not. Uh, but but we will get in, we will get in, into that um, fascinating book uh, a little bit later. Oh, okay, good. That's coming up. Huh? Yeah, Pope Francis. All right. Well, uh, Steve, that was a great review. Really gave us a good historical background on this papal succession idea and how it took place. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I see nothing godly about it. I see nothing but ungodliness okay. with the whole thing from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. Even the misinterpretation that Roman Catholics give to uh, Matthew chapter 16, dealing with Peter the Rock and all that stuff. Uh, but the, we've got stuff on that already, so we won't worry about it. There was videos that we've done on that. But uh, here was just some great history that most people won't get their hands on because they don't, they don't spend the time like you have done mm -hmm. to do the research, to do the reading of all this material, to have read every one of Carl Keating's books. I will admit right now I've never read any page he's written. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but I knew if I told you to do it, since you're our, our director of research, you would do it all. So praise okay. the Lord. What a gift from the Lord that you are. But uh, anyway, it was a great presentation. I uh, want to let people know that uh, our channel, Sea uh, Answers TV on YouTube, has an entire playlist dealing with Roman Catholicism. At the time, we're actually videotaping at this moment. We have 187 videos on our playlist on Roman Catholicism, mm -hmm. which you can find on our main YouTube channel, See Answers TV. Just scroll down a little bit till you see the playlist called Dealing with Roman Catholicism, Idolatry, and the Virgin Mary. Click on that title, and it'll take you to another screen that has all the videos. But this is going to be so outdated to say 187, 187 videos, because later tonight, after we're done with all this, mm. I'm going to load another video up from a <laughs> conference that was done in Illinois uh, uh, that will be part five of that particular conference, and that'll make it 188. Okay. <laughs> so by that time, and who knows what it'll be by the time we actually have this video out to the public. Mm. So... Uh, Keep an eye on that and particularly check out that, uh, that that playlist because it has every video we've been doing for almost 30 years now, uh, from back then to, up to the present, uh, on all kinds of subjects pertaining to Roman Catholicism. But I have to admit, in this particular video, this has been one of the most in-depth, even though you're just skimming the skim service. Skimming it, you took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, just for a, a, a great highlight overview, of 
what this this papal succession actually means in reality. All right, uh, with that said, I'm Larry Wessels with Steve Morrison. Steve, thanks for a great presentation, okay. brother. Appreciate it. Uh, join us again next time for another uh, program of Christian Answers Presents. With that said, I want you to always remember, and I say this at the end of almost every show we do, uh, remember what Jesus said in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And that's the Christ of the Scripture. It's not the Christ of traditions of men or what this guy thinks or that guy thinks, whatever. It's the Christ of the Scripture. You must believe on Him, have faith in Him alone, and believe in His grace alone through Scripture alone, and Thou can be saved. That's Acts 16, 31. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. With that, thank you for joining us. Join us again next time. God bless you all. Bye-bye. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.